It has become something of an annual tradition to do a Q&A. It's always interesting for me to see difference between what I put out there and what some of the questions are that you have. So today, that's what we're going to do, bust it into a bunch of questions that you have asked. Let's jump right into it. Welcome to the most passionate content for card collectors on YouTube and possibly the whole entire internet. As usual, I am your host, Jake Roy, 90s b-ball cards here on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, a little bit of TikTok, got back on there. Uh, so today, like I said, we've got a Q&A, uh, questions that you've submitted through a number of different avenues uh, I was taking questions in. So before we get into the questions, I want to preface what we're going to go over. So there were a number of questions that were kind of uh, in the line of thinking about cards as investments. You guys know most passionate card collecting content on YouTube. So I will answer those questions to the best of my ability. I, however, uh, might not be satisfying some of the people that are asking about investment type of advice or, or what have you. So, uh, like I said, I will answer the questions to the best of my ability. This is not investment advice. These are not suggestions. We're not getting into picks. That'll probably be a topic in the Q&A. Uh, so, uh, I just want to preface it with that. You might be a little bit disappointed if you're looking for investment advice or picks or stuff like that. Uh, but, like I said, we'll answer the questions you'll see what we're talking about. So let's get right into the Q&A and see what we got. All right, uh, so let's jump right in. Trying a little bit of a different camera angle for this year's Q&A, something a little different, you know, year over year, gotta make some changes, but the same old, you know, little wine cooler there for uh, holding the question. So let's get right in with the first question. All right, so from uh, the Luker Tiger Braun, Luke or Tiger LeBron podcast, a uh, friend of the channel, probably going to do a podcast with them coming up soon. So uh, it's fitting to start off the video with their question. So their question is, uh, what is your favorite card in your collection? So uh, starting off with a little bit of a softball down the middle. So uh, my favorite card, if I had to pick one right now, it's like picking your favorite kid. Uh, you know, so I would say right now it is my Jambalaya of Penny. Uh, that one I got at National, it's one of those cards I've loved since I was a kid, always wanted, never really thought it would, you know, be a card I'd, I'd land, potentially might be one of those that's always going to be a white whale, and I was able to make a deal for it. Uh, one of those that was a tough deal to make for me, but uh, very happy with the card I ended up with, so uh, that would have to be my number one in my uh, collection for my favorite right now. All right, uh, another friend of the show, Chris House of Jordan. So he asks, what advice would you give to someone who is brand new to the hobby? And uh, that could not be any more different than the last question. It is very uh, definitely a difficult question. Uh, and for those who haven't watched, uh, the guys from the Card Ladder team, the, the guys and gal from the Card Ladder team have uh, Sports Card Culture, where they answered a very similar question to this uh, and giving it some advice. So I don't think it's a one size fits all. Uh, I did have an interview with a friend of mine who's into crypto and uh, was interested in some of the card stuff that I posted and we talked about some of the ways that she could get into cards if she so chooses. So uh, one of the suggestions that I've had in the past is rip open some wax. That's pretty difficult to do right now. Uh, so I would say consume some content, get to know some people in the hobby, get connected a little bit, get into the hobby atmosphere online, uh, the better parts of it, and uh, see what's out there. Kind of start looking at some uh, auctions, some listings, and just see some of the cards, see what catches your eye. Uh, spend some time in the the hobby. Let it you know kind of wash over you. Get immersed <laughs> in the hobby uh, and see what it has to offer, and then start kind of picking your lane. If you want to look at sets, if you want to look at a player, if you want to look at you know certain years, there's a million different ways to go. But once you're kind of immersed in it, once you've surrounded yourself with some good folks that might be able to advise you as well or show you some things, uh, I think that what 
piques your interest is going to lead you in the right direction. Uh, and when wax becomes a little bit more easy to find, I would definitely suggest ripping open some wax because that's a lot of fun. I mean, another thing that you can do that uh, I definitely have seen others do that are a little bit more seasoned in the hobby, but definitely is a great way to learn is pick up some lots. Uh, if you can find somebody who can help guide you to get some decent lots, not repack products or, or stuff like that, uh, you know, that is a great way to see some of the different stuff and uh, really uh, educate yourself on what's out there. So, you know, a lot of different avenues, but, you know, number one thing is just immersing yourself in the hobby before you even buy a card, I would say, at this point. All right, next question, long one here from uh, Dwayne Skinner. So if you had to pick a few key characteristics which des uh, distinguish your passion for 90s basketball cards from basketball cards in the 2000s, 2010s and later, uh, what would be those key factors? And he gives some suggestions. So for me, the number one thing that keeps me coming back to the 90s is nostalgia, nostalgia, nostalgia. Um, so I've got tons of great memories with friends, with family, the products, just lots and lots of nostalgia. Um, you know, I love the products, of course. Uh, I love the designs. I love the originality. I love the history that you can see through the 90s. A lot of stuff that we love today, pretty much everything that we love today, was started in the 90s or at least had its genesis in the 90s. So uh, number one thing for me, though, has to be the nostalgia. All right, next question. Uh, another friend of the channel, Wax Museum Podcast, Kyle. So we've done a lot of stuff together. Uh, and he has done a guest host position uh, spot on this. The only guest host, in fact, uh, on the channel. So uh, multi-part question, but all getting at the same thing. So what is your, what's your, what's your Penny Hardway collecting philosophy? Uh, I've seen a few Panini and Phoenix Suns cards sneak into your collection. Are you loosening up the standards as grails become harder to find, or have you always been receptive to those things? So, uh, a big old yes <laughs> to all of this. Uh, so, uh, my my main core Penny Hardaway collection are Penny Hardaway cards from the 90s when he played with the Magic. I enjoy some of the cards where he was in that first year of his son's uniform. You know, you get some second year son where he had that uniform on as well. Uh, and then I also am, you know, gonna gonna be soft on some cards that might be key cards, you know, uh, chrome refractor, stuff like that. Cards that have some eye appeal, cards that maybe, uh, you know, I, I love shoes, so if there's something neat uh, that he's wearing for shoes or a neat jersey, like something that has some intrigue to me during his playing years. Uh, and then yes, I have opened my eyes to some Panini stuff. Uh, that is eye-catching, it always has to have eye appeal. It doesn't always have to necessarily be rare or valuable. Uh, if it's interesting or, you know, sometimes I'm susceptible to a good story. If somebody kind of pitches a card to me as far as like why it's an interesting card and there's a penny version and it's a penny neat card, I might be interested. You know, there is definitely some eye-catching penny cards uh, that were made by Panini and Panini is probably still going to put out. So, uh, yeah, I've definitely gotten more Panini cards, you know, had to get the 2012 Prism and the 2012 Prism Silver or the Prism Prism, as it was called at that point. Um, had to get some of those iconic things, some of those, you know, it was the first Prism set, uh, stuff like that. You, Kyle, opened my eyes to the blues that were in, I think, 2014, which would go perfectly with the blue jersey that Penny had in that card. So, you know, some fun stuff that is eye-catching and, uh, you know, has some intrigue to me. Um, will always find its way, but definitely the core PC is, is uh, Penny in the Magic uniform uh, in his playing days. But uh, I, I always venture out a little bit, right? And to answer your question about, uh, you know, why some of that might be, like, definitely some of it has to do with how difficult it is at this point to get a new item in my PC. Uh, there are not a lot of cards that are still missing. Uh, you know, a lot of them are hard to find or very valuable uh, and, you know, difficult to, to obtain. I have to make a lot of moves before I can get a card like a Jambalaya or, you know, a, a game dated, uh, you know, that's getting pricey now too. So, you know, stuff like that uh, definitely inhibits how many I can can attain. And sometimes I get the itch and I want to get something new and uh, I've got to look elsewhere than my core PC. So uh, yeah, definitely a whole bunch of yes there. All right, next one is uh, Matt Chalupa, I think is how you say the name. 
Uh, what are your favorite forgotten jerseys from the 90s or 2000s? So, uh, yeah, there are a ton. Number one for me, uh, probably not forgotten though, is the blue pinstripe uh, magic jersey. Uh, that's a classic, but yeah, probably not a forgotten one. Uh, some others, if I'm trying to dig a little deeper, uh, and I know you gave some suggestions in this one, uh, I love that Raptors jersey that Vince Carter wore in the slam dunk contest. A lot of people talk about the big Raptor with the kind of crazy pinstripes, uh, but I love that purple on the front, black on the back. I remember when I saw that for the first time, it was just radical to me uh I, it blew my mind i thought it was two different jerseys altogether i didn't know what i was seeing the first time i saw it uh you know so that's really cool yeah the lightning bolt warriors always a fun one love looking at that one uh and it, they didn't wear it for very long so uh those are two that i always think about you know and then if i'm gonna really try to think long and hard about another jersey uh, i kind of have a soft spot for the navy blue rockets jersey with kind of like those faded pinstripes it is very 90s very big logo and it uh, brings back fun memories because i got the david robinson authentic when i had the option of getting you know the david robinson black spurs authentic which is probably the most plain of the three that i'm going to mention uh the black Black Suns Charles Barkley, which the one I probably should have gone with in hindsight, or the navy blue Hakeem with the Rockets. Uh, you know, so those those two that I didn't choose are the ones I wish I got. So you know, some memories tied to that too. And I think uh, a jersey that not a ton of people talk about, uh, but the ones who like it love it. All right, next question comes uh, from another friend of the show, Buck and Tear. I mean, everybody's a friend of the show, right? Uh, but met him at National this year, so uh, a lot of fun, and hopefully we get to hang out a little bit more at AC. So question uh, from him, three collecting goals for 2022. I think there's another question submitted about uh, some goals for 2022. So uh, trying to think through three of them. I should have probably thought of this now uh, before this point in the year. <laughs> we're getting close to the end uh but number one is getting back to national getting back to ac i think i'm going to be able to do it i uh, got some family stuff planned but pretty sure i'm going to be able to make it happen so that's the number one goal for me is uh as uh those back pages would say aim for ac uh, in 2022. So uh, that's the number one goal. Number two goal would be adding something new to my penny PC, a new piece uh, from the 90s. Uh, and like I said, those are those are getting few and far between. And then I'd say the third goal, if I had to pick a third one, uh, you know, and I, I kind of don't like to use the word, but consolidate a little bit. My PC is very expansive. I'm not getting rid of any of my core PC cards, but I've got a lot of cards that I've got duplicates of. I've got cards that aren't PC players uh, that I don't need. So paring down some of that, which then helps to fund me getting a new item in my PC. So, you know, goal number three helps with goal number two. So uh, I would say those are the three top goals of 2022 for me at this point. All right, the next one, a uh, question from Great Valley Sports Cards. Uh, will you dance to No Diggity uh, on your next video? Uh, no Diggity, no doubt. Um, you have to tune in and see the next video to find out. Uh, sorry, that's going to have to be, I mean, the answer could be no doubt, uh, uh, but tune in and see. All right, H2O Collector. Uh, so... Yeah, I had to ask for some clarification. So I'll give you the clarification that he provided me. Uh, what are the maximum criteria that include 90s insert card with a high odds number? Is 1 in 10 included? So I think that what you are asking here is what is considered rare for the 90s? So, uh, and it's very subjective. What's rare to one person might not be rare to somebody else. Something uh, numbered to 10, certainly rare. Something numbered to 100, probably considered rare by most people. Something numbered to 500 might not be considered rare by all people. Uh, so if we're looking at pack odds, you know, I really start thinking about things as being rare or hard to pull when they're one per box. Uh, but I think if it's something that's one per case, that's probably gonna get more of a unanimous yes. Uh, so, you know, somewhere in the middle is probably the line uh, where you start to get, uh, you know, the tipping point of equilibrium. So, uh, you know, 
something that's one per case or more rare, uh, something that's numbered to 100 or less. I think those are sort of things that you could say. But, um, you know, sometimes I've, you know, there have been cards that I've been trying to get in my PC for years that were one per pack in retail packs. Uh, you know, to say that they're rare in terms of their print run might not be accurate, but rare in terms of being able to find them. Uh, might also be accurate. So again, the definition can really depend based on, on the card, but uh, you know, one per case or number to less than a hundred, I would say uh, uh, you're gonna get general consensus on that as being rare. All right, Dar's 90s cards. Uh, any card shop stories from days of yore? So <laughs> I could go on for days of card shop stories. A lot of my stories actually are uh, stories about other people. Uh, you know, so a lot of fun happened at card shops with other folks. So uh, one of my favorite card sh uh, shop stories, my buddy Mitch went into our local card shop when we were kids uh, and was going to buy a pack was thinking about buying a pack of EX2001. Uh, and the, at that point, those packs were pretty pricey at about $5 a piece. They, uh, to us kids, seemed like, uh, you know, they were a lifetime away to get. So he was going to buy that pack, left to go do something else, came back, was gonna still buy that pack. Somebody else had come in, gotten that pack, opened it, and pulled a Shaq Jambalaya out of all the cards that could have been pulled. It had to be a Jambalaya. Uh, and of, you know, one of the biggest stars uh, at that point in time in the set, and definitely still today, one of the top guys in that set. So, uh, you know, we always, we always remember those ones we miss, right? So that was a bummer for him. Uh, another one uh, that I remember is uh, my brother and I loved getting the, you know, the repack, the mystery packs. So, you know, we like to rip packs. We like the mystery of it all. And uh, he, the card shop owner, had a basket of these packs you could rifle through and look. They were all covered up with paper, so you didn't know what was inside. But he guaranteed each of those bunches had one card in one of the packs that was worth $10 at least. So we always wanted to get those and always wanted to get that $10 card. My brother opened one and he pulled out the $10 card and that $10 card in that pack was the 9798 Flare Showcase Row 3 Michael Jordan. And uh, what a beautiful card. It's just a classic card. I love that card partially because of the nostalgia. And my brother screamed so loud when he pulled that card out of there. Uh, you know, we knew it was a $10 card and we were very excited because we had opened a number of those and, and hadn't pulled it. I can remember where we were. Uh, you know, that is a memory ingrained in my, my, my mind. Uh, and then a not so great one that was a pack pull of my brother's is uh, when we went to a different card shop that we didn't frequent very often. He opened a pack of 9899 Upper Deck and he pulled out a uh, Superpowers Quantum Silver of Trace McGrady number to 100. Uh, and that's really what jettisoned our buddy Joe to now collect that set. Uh, he pulled that card out, didn't really know a lot about it, neither of us did. Uh, and the card shop owner then said, hey, I'll take that card off your hands and give you a free pack. Uh, and my dad knew that that probably wasn't a fair trade. I uh, got a little bit frustrated with the guy and said, hey, look, if you wanna, if you wanna trade for the card, you know, let's let's make a fair offer and, and the guy you know it, it got a little heated in there so we ended up leaving never went back to that card shop so uh you know and again i could go on there's lots more stories but uh, those are a couple of my favorites all right next question we've got here all right uh one of two from cajun cardboard uh we've got also so this is the second question he asked uh, what is your personal favorite low, mid, and high-end insert set of the 90s? So, so similar to the question about scarcity or rare, uh, it depends, right? Uh, because everybody's going to define those differently. But if we're asking me, which we are, uh, so for a low-end one, uh, you know, there's a ton of things I could choose. You know, we could talk about this for, for hours. Uh, so I'm going to pick one that doesn't get a lot of love, in my opinion. So 99-2000 Fleer Tradition Masters of the Hardwood. I just love the design. I love the theming on those cards. You know, some embossing, some hollow foil. They're beautiful cards. Every time I look at the Penny or the Kobe or a couple others that I have in my collection, I always just, you know, I marvel at how incredibly easy they are to obtain and you know how inexpensive they are uh but how much detail went into them you know some some designers did really good work it could have been the arenas uh, i'm not sure who designed those but they did really good work they definitely put a lot of attention to detail into those uh you know and i think that they you know 
a lot of people, uh, if they don't already have them, should get one to enjoy one. Uh, they're really cool, and there's a lot of good players in that set as well. So uh, that's just one of the cards from Fleer Tradition in the late 90s uh, that, that I love. That's, you know, low end and, uh, and really easy to get. So uh, that's what I would say for low mid end. Uh, I would go with 97 SPX, the Hollow View Heroes. Uh, that's a set that I've debated uh, collecting. I've got the Jordan, I've got the Penny, I've got the KG and a few other guys. So uh, at some point I might collect that whole set, but uh, gorgeous set. You guys know, I love that SPX set. I love the die cuts and those inserts are the only ones that are made on the vertical instead of the horizontal plane, which I think adds a lot to them. You know, again, I could go on for a long time about the design on those beautiful cards. I really love them. Uh, and then for a high-end insert set, I'm going to go with, with my favorite uh, in my collection and go with the Jambalaya. Uh, those cards are gorgeous. I mean, it's one of those cards, they look gorgeous in pictures. When you get one in hand, it only is better. It only gets better with those. Uh, every time I look at it, I get happy. So uh, Jambalaya is my, my number one for a high-end set. All right, Loot Pack 27. Uh, QA question is, what are your collecting slash PC goals for the coming year. So uh, we talked about the top three with Buck and Tear. So, um, you know, if I'm gonna add some more, it's gonna be pretty difficult, but uh, National, number one up there, adding to my core PC of Penny, uh, you know, and, and kind of paring down some of the stuff that uh, is extra weight. I need to pare down extra weight uh, physically as well. So uh, maybe that's a goal that I can also have for the year outside of my PC. Um, yeah, so, so I would reiterate those I really can't think of any others right now, <laughs> but uh, uh, if I think of any, we'll discuss it. All right, DR Cards 2021. What is your favorite card that you have? So uh, the same question essentially from Luca, Ti Luca Tiger uh, LeBron podcast. So uh, I'll give you a different one. My number two, uh, if I had to pick uh, another recent addition would be my 99-2000 Top Stadium Club Chrome First Day Issue Refractor. Uh, yes, that is a mouthful. Uh, and mine happens to be a BGS-10. So if it wasn't rare enough being numbered to 25, adding that BGS-10 designation to it only heightens that scarcity. And having gotten it for a card that I submitted to PSA that I've had since I was a child, uh, and that Kobe Metal Rookie, and it happened to get a Gem Mint 10, uh, unexpectedly uh, a great surprise and to then move that and get that penny card that's been a dream card of mine forever uh, you know that's definitely one of my most favorite cards uh, and a recent pickup as well so that probably adds to it as well right all right cardboard insights uh, what 90 sets will see a resurgence in the next year as the hobby continues to grow uh, you know, so I think this is probably uh, <laughs> going to be in the line with the investment question. Uh, you know, my, my crystal ball is broken. Uh, it has been since I got it. So uh, hard to say, uh, you know, a resurgence would, would indicate that it was prominent and then it dropped off in prominence and then it would come back up in prominence. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I can think about cards that I have in my collection that I would want to, you know, uh, I would want to see them. It, it would be uh, a benefit to me personally. Um, you know, so uh, it, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, there's a lot of cards that I think uh, go underappreciated, go uh, uh, fly under the radar. You know, first day issue refractors, uh, for one, uh, I think those uh, are underappreciated. I think that those are extraordinarily rare. And if there's a Jordan that said, I think they would. Uh, be a mo lot more collectible. I mean, some of the other insert sets that I've talked about, the Masters of the Hardwood, uh, Great Expectations is another Flare Tradition set that's not rare, uh, but gorgeous, uh, that I think would benefit from a Jordan being in that set. Same thing with Masters of the Hardwood. Um, you know, so those could definitely pick up. Um, I mean, a resurgence, you know, you're really making me think. Uh, it's, it's kind of a troubling question. Uh, I would go with 93, 94 Scoring Kings. Um, I think that's one of those sets that brings back a lot of nostalgia for people. Uh, I think that it is just one of those entry level Jordan cards that everybody uh, wants to have or, uh, you know, wants to upgrade the one that they have. Uh, so I've got a PSA 7. 
uh, that I, I submitted for grading myself that I've had for a while. So, um, you know, I'm going to go with Scoring Kings. It's a set that I've thought about collecting. Uh, the Shack had seen a big boom at a point in time, but you get a lot of great stars. You know, David Robinson, Patrick Ewing, Dominique Wilkins, uh, just to name a few. So, um, yeah, I'll go with, I'll go with 93 and 94 Scoring Kings. I think that's a, that's a safe one. All right. Raleigh Al, uh, friend of the channel. So uh, he asked two questions in one comment, so we're gonna answer both of them at the same time. Uh, so you get two for one. Uh, so number one, uh, will you move or buy in relation to the Kobe documentary? And then number two is what event could be equal to the last dance as a market catalyst? So uh, similar, so uh, you know, they're, they're relatable. So uh, the Kobe documentary it has no impact on on my buying or selling. Um, you know, if I've got Kobe cards that I'm thinking about moving and I see that it seems like a good time in the market for whatever reason, uh, you know, that might be a reason to move them. I have some Kobe cards that I've posted for sale, uh, you know, that I've graded or, you know, that I'm not gonna grade or, or whatever the case may be. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of just watch what's going on on recent comps and, and make my decision based on that. You know, sometimes when a card gets to a price that's not in my locked in my PC, uh, that doesn't make sense for me to hold on to, and it makes sense for me to move that into funds to uh, get another PC card, that's that's when I'll move it. So um, yeah, I don't think it's gonna have any impact on my decision making. Uh, it might have impact on others. Uh, remains to be seen, but we'll, uh, you know, we'll get into the second one. So. I'm gonna say no. And the reason that I'm gonna say no is because I don't think that the last dance in a vacuum was the jettison for the uh, market catalyst, uh, you know, the market explosion. I think COVID uh, and people being locked at home uh, and a lot of other factors relating to COVID really had more of an impact uh, than the last dance. The last dance happened to be something that happened to have a bigger impact because of COVID uh, than I, I think it normally would. So, uh, you know, if we get another international pandemic and there happens to be a sports documentary that's going to drop around that same time and all the sports leagues across the world are shut down and the only sporting event that we can see is in a documentary, then sure, we could see that happen again. And at that point, I don't think it would really matter who the player were to be. It could be Tim Duncan, it could be Grant Hill, uh, you know, any number of 90s players I could list off or before or after the 90s. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna say no. All right, Martin Cards. Uh, what are some inserts that uh, were hard to get odds wise from the 90s, early 2000s, but are underpriced today uh, that could be great buys? So, you know, again, we're getting into some of the crystal ball territory here. Um, I'm going to go with the first day issue refractors once again. Uh, those are rare. Uh, number to 25 each those I don't see get a ton of love. I mean even the Kobe uh, What I can't remember the last time I saw one sell but it went for less than I thought it would go for uh, If I remember correctly, I don't even know if the comp's still sitting out there on eBay So uh, maybe I can try to drag drag that up and, and find it somewhere, but it might be harder than I than I'm estimating uh, you know, so that's that's one that I think uh, definitely is underappreciated. I mean, one of the other things I've talked to some friends about is there are some uh, box toppers, some jumbos uh, that have refractor parallels from 98, 99, 99, 2000. So there are the Stadium Club Chrome uh, jumbo refractors. There's also 98, 99 Topps Finest jumbo refractors uh, that were very hard to get. Those, those jumbos were box toppers, but the refractors were significantly more rare. Uh, you know, so I think that those fly under the radar and I get it. A lot of people don't like collecting jumbos. How do you store them? They don't fit in a box. You're gonna bring them to a card show. How are you gonna display it? All kinds of questions. But, uh, you know, for how rare they are, uh, in a lot of cases, it's like one per case or less. Um, you know, being able to get one for 10 to $50, depending on the player, typically, uh, I think that's a bargain. Uh, and it's a fun chase also. They don't pop up very often. So sometimes fun, something that isn't expensive, but hard to find because they don't surface a lot, uh, that can be fun. So yeah, I mean, I could I could list a whole bunch of things that I think uh, could deserve more love. Uh, you know, I talked about the great expectations and the Masters of Hardwood. I've talked before about Star Attractions Gold. I've talked about game dated cards. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, but there's also reasons why they don't uh, demand as much 
uh, value on the market. Uh, you know, some people just don't like them as much as others, and uh, you know, they're rare, they're fun chases, um, and, and we'll see what happens over the next, next years. All right, MJ Card 23 Collector, uh, what is your best and worst investment? Uh, which player, which cards? Again, um, get into the investment advice, uh, <laughs> which I just love. Uh, so I'm probably going to disappoint you with this uh, answer, but uh, I'm going to say none. Uh, and, and here's the reason why. Uh, I don't invest in cards. I collect cards. Um, you know, so I buy cards for my PC, I buy cards of interest, I sell cards when they don't make sense in my PC anymore, or the value doesn't make sense to hold on to. Uh, I, once I lock a card into my PC, you know, like the Jambalaya, I'm not moving that card, ever. Um, you know, so that's never gonna move. It doesn't matter if that card goes up to $20,000, unless there's something significant happening in my family and I need to liquidate my cards, uh, you know, for a life altering reason. Um, you know, those cards aren't going anywhere. Uh, you know, so if I move a card, it's because I've gotten a duplicate of it. Um, I'm going to move it on to another collector or it's a card that doesn't fit in my PC and I get it for below comps. You know, sometimes I will buy cards of players who aren't PC players, uh, because they're a good deal. You know, if it's a $50 card and I can pick it up for 40, uh, you know, sometimes I'll do that and then I can, you know, take that extra $10 if I can move it to somebody and, uh, and put that into my PC. So, uh, you know, I, I really, uh, revile the, the idea of investing in my collection. It's not, it's not the way that I collect. It is the way that other people collect and that's fine for them. So, um, you know, I... I don't have a bad investment because I haven't invested. If I look at my card ladder portfolio, if you will, uh, the cards that I've sold, I've made a significant return on. Uh, but a lot of that's because I've had them since I was a kid. Uh, you know, so a card that was five dollars when I picked it up, and you know, as a kid in the year two thousand, now being worth fifty dollars, you know, it, it's been in my collection for twenty years. I didn't pick it up for five dollars because I thought it was going to be worth you know twenty or fifty dollars twenty years down the road. Um, you know, I picked it up because I liked it, and then uh, it didn't make sense in my collection anymore. I mean, when I was a kid, I had dozens of players that I would you know PC. Uh, and you know today I don't really care to hold on to Ray Allen cards or Shreef Abdurrahim cards or Stefan Marbury cards or you know a litany of other players. Uh, yeah, so I, I'll I'll move those uh, all the time if uh, if it makes sense. So uh, sorry, might not be the answer you're looking for. All right, Cajun Cardboard. Uh, this was the first question, but the second one we're answering, uh, just the order it fell in. So uh, is the Michael Jordan 90s insert slash parallel market beginning to race again, uh, or is it only PSA 10s? Uh, so then he goes on to say that he's repeatedly losing auctions where he uh, he's willing to pay or he has bid above comps and, and he goes on from there. So. Um, I don't know. Let, let's look at the index on the card ladder, uh, but it also depends, uh, as a lot of these do. Uh, how zoomed in or zoomed out do you want to look at data? Uh, you know, if I zoom out to two years ago, um, it doesn't look like anything really dropped significantly. If I zoom into the last month, maybe it does. Uh, you know, so it depends on when you're looking at the data, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I can look at a personal example that I have uh, with the intense. Uh, PSA 10 Jordan and that card hasn't moved in price, you know, maybe up or down, you know, a tiny bit since I bought it. Uh, but essentially it's the same price uh, since I got that in my collection. So, um, you know, in that one instance, in that microcosm, uh, it, it would be a no. But there are other cards I'm sure that we're seeing different stuff in uh, for PSA 10s. I'm sure that you're seeing different stuff happen with PSA 9s. It, it probably depends on a case-by-case -case basis, as it usually does with, with cards. And again, if you're looking at, you know, the aggregate of Jordan cards and inserts and parallels uh, from the 90s, uh, it depends on how zoomed in or zoom out uh, you want to look at that data. So, um, yeah, it, it all depends. Uh, I don't know. I'm not in the Jordan market day-to-day -day either. I'm in the penny market. Iverson, you know, I'm looking at those cards. I'm looking at what my collection is, is doing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm paying attention to that stuff on a very regular basis. Jordan's uh, not so much. So uh, I'd rely on the data and card ladder over the last few years. 
All right, uh, Alex Jardine. <laughs> okay, uh, thoughts on sports card investors. So hey, you asked it. It's fair game. Um, so full transparency, Jeff and I recently had a phone call, uh, and you know he was uh, not thrilled with some comments that I made uh, recently on some public posts on Instagram. Uh, so figured you know we'd jump on a call. It took us a while to uh, schedule it because my schedule's crazy, uh, and you know he's a busy guy also. So uh, you know. I'm not going to go into all the details of, of what we discussed, but, uh, you know, I've said to him and I've said to other people, I really didn't like when he was doing the picks videos. Uh, I don't really watch their content, uh, over at sports card investor. It's not all him. Uh, I've seen some stuff, you know, teapots put out some, some fun stuff about, uh, comparing PMGs and kabooms and other inserts. So, uh, you know, there are occasional videos I will watch from that channel, but most of the time I'm not. I really enjoyed uh, his stuff when he went to the 2019 National. I enjoy some of his card show videos. Uh, you know, that stuff is fun and fine and helpful and, and it gets people excited to go to shows and uh, as well as, you know, uh, Sasha T and a lot of other people who do vlogs and, and whatnot. I mean, the Card Ladder team did an incredible job with their multi-part series from the National this last year. Um, you know, so I love stuff like that. Uh, and when they put out content that's good, I like it. When they put out content that's focused on investing, that's not my speed. And I've also seen it do damage. Uh, I don't like it. Uh, I don't like what I, I've seen people personally lose money. They've complained to me. They've thought about getting out of the hobby. I've seen people that have gotten out of the hobby because, and they point directly at some of the advice and, and picks and, and that type of content. I don't like that stuff. Um, you know, so... So I, I guess we can probably leave it at there. I mean, if you've got specific questions, <laughs> DM me. We can chat privately, uh, you know, about it. But, uh, you know, that, that's what I shared with Jeff also. Uh, so uh, I'm not saying anything I wouldn't say to him. All right. Last question we're going to get to for today. Uh, Akeem Dreams 94. Uh, where do you see the, the Kobe market in the next 6 to 12 months? So, uh Sorry, bud. Uh, again, not going to be an answer you're probably going to love. Uh, again, crystal ball is broken. You know, I should probably get a crystal ball and throw it back here uh, and, and hang the sign on it because I, you know, this isn't the first time I've got investment type questions, but I have no idea. I, I don't think anybody knows. And if somebody tells you that they do know where the Kobe market's going for the next six to 12 months, they're not being honest. Uh, you know, nobody really knows what the future holds. People can guess, people can estimate. Uh, card collecting is a fickle thing. Uh, and before Kobe's, you know, untimely and tragic passing, I talked to a lot of people about, uh, I thought the Kobe market was a very strange marketplace. Uh, the Kobe collectors are an interesting group. Uh, you know, no, no shade thrown at them. It's just, it's an interesting player to collect because he's always kind of, uh, had that, uh, chip on his shoulder. And I think a lot of the collectors also have kind of that chip on their shoulder where Kobe's not MJ, he's not LeBron, but he is extremely good and he is uh, deserving to be in conversation with those guys. So uh, it's an interesting market. He's His cards have definitely dipped off for a lot of the more run of the mill cards. You know, my uh, my PSA 9 Tops rookie that I've had since a kid and, and graded a while back. And uh, I've seen that thing go from, you know, I think at its peak, it was, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred. And now I think last I looked, it's down to three or four hundred. Uh, you know, so will that bounce back? I, I don't know. There's no shortage of those cards. So I think that, you know, what we're seeing with Kobe cards is uh, indicative of a lot of other players where their rare stuff is still sought after. It's got a, uh, a, a smaller uh, sample size. It's got a smaller supply than there are collectors that are looking for that stuff. You're going to have Kobe collectors, you're going to have Lakers collectors, and you're going to have collectors who are just interested in basketball. that are all going to be interested in Kobe as one of, you know, one of the greatest players, you know, he's definitely on the 75 list. Uh, you know, so great players are always going to have, uh, eyeballs on their cards and collectibles. Uh, so when you're looking at cards, you know, like the first day issue refractor, there's only 25 of, uh, you, you can't satisfy, uh, the demand for a card like that with just 25 copies. So, uh, you know, cards like that are going to do well and cards like my, my tops, uh, is probably going to, you know, just ebb and flow with the, with the larger market. So, uh, you know, over the next six to 12 months, who knows, you know, will the documentary documentary have an impact? I don't think so. Uh, really what we're seeing right now is a lot of people speculate when they hear about a documentary coming, 
uh, that it's going to have a last dance effect. We saw the same thing happen with Magic Johnson. And what ends up happening is you get these little small spikes uh, on that player's cards because of the speculation. So basically people rush to those cards to speculate that they're gonna go up with a documentary and that creates a little bit of a rush. Some people will buy them at that peak and some people won't. They'll go back and normalize and uh, you know, it's it's really well in advance of any sort of documentary or anything like that. It's uh, the news of it is really the hype machine uh, and then the, uh, the rush of attention to it. So, um, you know, people chasing the puck, so to speak. So. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen with Kobe cards, but we'll all sit and watch together, right? All right, so that was a lot of fun. These are always fun uh, for me to do. I enjoy doing these because it's an interesting look, like I said, a little insight into some of the things that are top of mind. It was interesting to see a few Kobe questions come through. You guys know uh, I collect other guys than Kobe, so uh, you know that was interesting. Clearly, there's a lot of interest in Kobe cards. There was more investment type of questions than I've seen in prior years, so you know these... Give me an idea of what you're interested in. Not that I'm going to start creating pick videos. That's absolutely not going to happen. But uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you for all the questions. If I didn't get to yours, I apologize. Uh, shoot me a DM. I'll be happy to answer it privately if I didn't, if I missed it. Uh, you know, sometimes I, sometimes I miss things. That happens probably every year. So, uh, you know, let me know if, uh, if you get any questions throughout the year as well. Uh, you know, I'll try to do these as the interest is there, uh, maybe more frequently. I said that last year and we, we didn't <laughs> do that. So, uh, hopefully I can, I can stay true to that if you'd like to see more. I mean, question of the day, let me know down in the comments, uh, what question or what answer did I have that you felt was the most helpful or the most, most interesting? Which one did you like the best? Uh, you know, hopefully all my answers answered the questions to, you know, satisfactory level. I know some of them probably didn't, uh, you know, but let me know that. And let me know if you want to see more Q and a videos from me, uh, and how frequently you'd like to see those. So kind of multi-part question there, but, uh, let me know that down in the comments, uh, as always, this has been fun. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I answer your question to your satisfaction. Uh, if you're new here, please consider subscribing, hit that bell icon. So you don't miss any videos in the future. New videos dropping once, sometimes twice, a week. Uh, we look into parts of my PC, interview collectors at times, uh, open up packs, and so, so much more. Thanks. We'll talk later.